My name is Rex. But he's the king. So happy, so happy to see you all today. Dear me, what a joy. This is the reason why I had that vision of building this building for this right here, this right here. This is what I saw. And the service just before you was just this large, and what a joy to welcome you to the best thing on the south side of Austin yeah. on a Sunday morning. Now, I believe that. I believe that. And so you don't have to agree with that, but I'm going to keep saying that. And I, I really believe, I, I tell people all the time when I invite them to church, I say, come and hear our music and then put up with me about 25 minutes and you'll just love this place. Because yeah. I promise you we're going to love you till you can't be loved anymore. And we're going to do it right. And we're going to do it wholesome. And we're going to show you the love of God like you've never known. Because God is love. And what a joy to see you here today. I am overwhelmed. In fact, I've had to stop and just have cry sessions this morning. This just absolutely overwhelms me. It just overwhelms me. And so I'm overwhelmed. How about you? All right. All right. Would you stand to your feet, you incredible people? And... Uh, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna hold you long. That's what Henry the Eighth told his fifth wife. <laughs> That's old, folks. Yep, y'all hadn't been in church in a while if you hadn't heard that one. I'm gonna speak today on Jesus is risen. Dot dot dot. Indeed. Indeed. Now. While that's up there, I'm going to give you some synonyms for indeed. Jesus is risen, absolutely. He's risen. Amen. Amen. He's risen, certainly. He's risen, doubtlessly. He's risen easily. <laughs> I like that one. Hell couldn't stop him. He's risen for real. He's risen in truth. He's risen naturally. He's risen, of course. He is risen positively. He's risen really. He's risen, risen sure thing. He's risen undeniably, but this is the one I love. He's risen undoubtedly. Yes. He's up. He got up. Listen, there's 420 religions in the world, but just one resurrection. Amen. Just one. So I'm going to speak on that today. Turn to your neighbor and say, he won't be long. I promise I've been here before. So lean up and let me talk to you. You may be seated. Over the course of 150 or 1,500 years, 40 human authors inspired by the Holy Spirit, they were farmers and fishermen. They were poets and politicians. They were doctors and tax collectors, and they were kings. They wrote 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New, in three languages on three continents, that we call the Bible. It begins with a bang, a big bang. God says, let there be light. And those four words are still creating galaxies at the outer edge of the universe even today. And it ends the way it begins, God saying, I am making all things new. Look at your neighbor and say, God never gets old. His mercies are new every morning. The end of human history as we know it is the beginning of eternity in a place that is outside of our four dimensions, a place that is called heaven, a place where there's no more crying, no pain, no sickness, no dying. It's a place where wrong is made right, and God is with us, and we are with God. Between Genesis and Revelation, you have the fall of man, you have the great flood, you have Israel's exodus out of Egypt. You have judges and kings and the rise and fall of nations. You have villains. You have heroes. You have tragedies and, yeah, you have some comedy. The Bible has some of that. And of all the things mentioned in this book, there's one tipping point. There's one turning point. There's one defining moment, one exciting incident that changes everything. 
It's an empty tomb. An empty tomb. Everything that predates the resurrection points forward. And everything that postdates the resurrection points backward. It's a day when heaven invades earth, when eternity invades time, when the day, the day when life defeats death. So I say, Christ is risen, and you say, Amen. This choir has got to have some practice. You ready? Christ is risen. Thank you. I thought I'd have to call Randy out here to get you on the same, same note. Welcome to CLA today. It's Resurrection Sunday. And we celebrate here. It's our Super Bowl. And we already know the final score. We win. <laughs> if you're a guest here today or you're joining us online, we send you our cheer and our joy on this day. The day when it all made sense, the day it all came together, a day like none other, a wow day, a wonder of wonder days. See, faith, folks, is not the absence of doubt any more than courage is the absence of fear. You can't have one without the other. I wish I could say I have no doubt. I wish I could say I have no fear, but I can't because I'm human. Oh, I can wear a T-shirt that says no fear, but I, I do have it. There's a moment in the Word where Jesus is on his way out of Jericho, and he meets a man whose son is suffering with seizures. And the father at his wit's end says to Jesus, have mercy on us and help us if you can. And Jesus says all things are possible woo, to them that believe. My first sermon ever preached 52 years ago. And the dad says, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. That father speaks for all of us today, doesn't he? All of us are a mixture of faith and doubt, courage and fear. As soon as I'm omniscient, <laughs> knowing all, I'll let you know, but I would not hold my breath for that to come from me. I'll never be a know-it-all. Help me overcome my unbelief, I ask God from time to time. Help me overcome my fear. All of us are members of the Doubter Society. We're all in good company. Doubt is a feeling of uncertainty, a lack of conviction. And there are theological uncertainties. What should we believe about this God? There's intellectual uncertainties, not sure what to think about situations. And then there's circumstantial uncertainties. What do I do now? Some things sometimes just don't make sense. We all get this internal, what I call angst. That may be West Texas, but the angst. It's when the, we feel injustice. It's when we feel that bad things are happening to good people. It's kind of what we felt like is why was COVID such a big raging part of America and the world for almost two years? Why did that happen? But I, I, I told the staff, I told the staff, I said, we're going to have a great Easter this Easter for two reasons. And they wanted to know why. I said 2020 and 2021. Hey, 2022's here and we're alive and we're in church and we need to clap our hands and celebrate that today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we feel injustice when we don't understand a diagnosis or it's somebody's going through a divorce that we love or maybe it's us or a loss of a mom and dad or even worse, the loss of a child. This is where those who love Jesus found themselves right after the crucifixion. Their hearts are racing. Their minds are spinning and their will is suffering. That's where we start reading today. Luke 24, I want you to catch these words. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. They came to anoint him, and he wasn't there. Now, I think all of them had a little doubt. But while they were puzzled, another phrase, another translation said perplexed about this, suddenly two men 
in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to, men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. I love this. Their memories were jogged. When, they, when their memories were jogged, they recall the words of Jesus. Isn't it amazing that we remember what we should forget and sometimes forget what we should remember? That's often the difference between faith and doubt. See, I think faith is a function of God's faithfulness. And doubt is just forgetting what we should have remembered about God's faithfulness. He will never leave you. He'll never forsake you. He'll go with you always, even to the end of the world. Somebody say amen to that. So what I want to declare today is that God would jog our memories on this resurrection season, that everything he says and everything he's done will happen just the way he said it. God has spoken to you and about you because he's for you. And if God is for you, quit worrying about those who might be against you. Verse 9, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. Now there was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women. They didn't get their name in the book. That's bad. With them who told this to the apostles. But listen, this verse 11, but these words seemed to them like nonsense. See, when women came to tell the men, they didn't believe them. I like the identifying that the women were the first to witness the resurrection. I think it's kind of cool that women were the first to receive, see, and believe that Jesus was risen. Men, I got something to tell you today. (laughs) Women are more perceptive than we are. (laughs) Write that down, and I'll see you next week. (laughs) No, I'm going to be a bulldog and finish this message. See, women have ESP and we men have ESPN. (laughs) And that N is a no-no when it comes to ESP. All right. Mary Magdalene was known as the apostle to the apostles. You know, when we are created, there's seven spirits in us. Isaiah 11, the seven spirits of God are in every man. And Mary had seven spirits cast out of her. In other words, everything that was in her was broken. She was broken on the inside and God through Jesus Christ, healed her. And she became the apostle to the apostles. But then this last verse, it just kind of out of nowhere. However, Peter got up and ran to the tomb. That is so cool. Another time in another, another, another book, it said Peter and John ran to the tomb and John did outrun Peter. Now I see Peter as a man that likes to eat the catch that he caught. He probably had a grill on his boat. And he probably didn't wait to get back to shore to share with anybody. He wanted to eat it all himself. I see Peter's having a little bluebell belly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and he probably, he probably got tired running. But he ran to the tomb. Peter ran to the tomb. Here's the big deal about that. When your circumstances don't make sense, run to the tomb. <laughs> when you feel like your life is falling apart, run to the tomb. When you're wrestling with doubt and fear, run to the tomb. When you're wrestling with things in your life, when all else fails and you have have nothing left, you think, run to the tomb. The empty tomb is the answer to a thousand questions. The empty tomb is a solution to a thousand problems. And so I'll say it again, Christ is risen. On April the 14th, 1755, General Edward Braddock sailed up the Potomac River to a little town called Georgetown. That's where Braddock anchored his ship. And if you like history, that's where he also picked up a 23-year-old recruit named George Washington, who would serve as his aide in camp. Now today, close to the Theodore Roosevelt Bridge there in Washington, D.C., and not far from the Lincoln Memorial, there is a nondescript stone well with a small historical marker. I have a picture of it and you'll see it. There's the well, there's the marker. 
You can go see it when next time you're in Washington. There's a manhole cover on top of it and a ladder inside of that well. And 16 feet below the surface, there is a rock called Braddock's Rock. And it's the place where General Edward Braddock anchored his ship on April 14, 1755. It ranks as the oldest landmark in the nation's capital and predates America by several decades. It was the initial point for the earliest surveys of the capital city. If you look at the old maps, Braddock's Rock is called the key of all keys. Why? Because it established the coordinate system for the entire city. Every principal meridian that divides east from west and every baseline that divides north and south is measured from Braddock's Rock. Now hold that thought. 2,000 years ago, Jesus of Nazareth was betrayed and arrested and ultimately crucified at a place called Golgotha. It means the place of the skull. In first century Judea, Death by crucifixion was not uncommon. Many of you think it was probably uncommon. Most archaeologists declare there were probably, you ready for this, a thousand crucifixions every year around the time of Christ. That's three per day, folks. Three per day. So the crucifixion of Jesus between two thieves was just par for the course. A lot of people died on Roman crosses. But hear me today. Only one person predicted their death and pulled it off. His name was Jesus because he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. And he's also the resurrection and the life. If he could call Lazarus out of the grave in John 11, he could rise from the grave himself by the power of God because he is the resurrection and the life. And when he died on that cross, his body was placed in a tomb belonging to Joseph of Arimathea you got to love this. Who borrows a tomb? Someone who's going to need it for just three days. That's who. There are more than 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that give substance to my message today to help us identify the Messiah, who he is and who he was. This one that I'm fixing to read is very curious. 700 years before the birth of Jesus, the prophet Isaiah identified Jesus this way in 53 and 9. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich at his death. In other words, he would have had two graves. Well, who has two graves? I'm fixing to tell you. Like every other person crucified by the Romans, Jesus would have been assigned a grave with the criminals, which would fulfill half of the prophecy of Isaiah. The other half is fulfilled when a rich man begged for the body of Jesus named Joseph of Arimathea, and he offers his own tomb. It was a glory moment. So Jesus is placed in that tomb, and the rock is rolled into place, and according to Roman custom, the tomb was not only sealed, but it was protected by guards. The reason? Because there was this rumor that someone was going to try to steal the body of Jesus. Now that plan backfires. Because the guards... I love these guys who were set there to watch the tomb actually bring evidence that the body was not stolen. They worked for the Romans, but they told the truth about a Jewish leader. I love those guards. They could be ushers in our church because they wouldn't be stealing from the offering plate when they took up the offering. They were honest people. Truthful men. No one stole the body. And in fact, it was a supernatural moment. Somebody in this house needs to believe this today. You need to get a grip, a life grip on it. Not a death grip, but a life grip because he came to give life. So early in the morning on Resurrection Sunday, the women approached the tomb and they noticed that the rock's been rolled away. And Matthew's gospel records it this way. There was a violent earthquake and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled back the stone and sat on it. You know, it hit me in first service. It's amazing that the Romans thought their stone could stop the rock of ages. <laughs> Made me happy. The guards shook and fell like dead men. And the angel spoke to the women and said, Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen just as he said. All of that just to say this. You ready? An empty tomb is our key of keys. 
Braddock's Rock set the measurements for all of Washington, D.C. But the tomb sets the measurement for everything we do. That rock that was rolled away is how we measure time. It's how we measure eternity. It's how we measure life, and it's how we measure death. I want to, I want to declare to you, because Jesus got up, we're going to get up one day. When you drive by, when you drive by cemeteries, when you drive by cemeteries, just remember one day when the Lord comes back, as he left, he's going to come back the same way. Those cemeteries are going to just start rumbling, and graves are going to break open, and people that claim Christ in their life are going to be risen, and we that remain are going to be caught up in the air with them, and we're going to ever be with the Lord. I believe that he's the first fruit of our resurrection, and we're all going to be resurrected one day just like he was. We don't believe in happily ever after here. We believe in something that's lasting, enduring. That we can believe in from cradle to grave. We believe in happily forever after. Forever, forever. Everybody say the tomb is empty. Say hallelujah. See, Christianity is not a moral code. That's, I'm preaching now. Christianity is not a moral code. Yet we do practice something called the Sermon on the Mount. We love our enemies. We do good to them who persecute us. We turn the other cheek. We go the extra mile. We give the coat off our back. But this is not behavior modification. Jesus didn't come to just make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. And give them abundant life. Christianity is not just a religion. It's a relationship with a living, risen Savior. So, I told you I wouldn't keep you long. I know y'all hate to see me quit, but I'm fixing to quit. I feel so good. I feel so good about this service today. I, I really could preach another hour and a half about this because it's eating me up. I, just, I tried to put it in about 1,900, 2,000 words but it's so difficult. But I'm going to close with these two questions. 2,000 years ago, the world woke up to an empty tomb. Here are the two questions. Do you believe it? Yes. And are you living like it? Yes. That second one gets you on it. Yes. Romans 10, 9 and says, If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you confess that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, Paul wrote, you'll be saved. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is a tenet of our faith. I receive his resurrection by faith. I cannot go to Jerusalem today and try to prove physically that he got up. But I believe he got up. It's what we build everything we believe on. If Jesus did not get up out of that grave, then we are preaching a powerless gospel. But if he did get up, there's no gospel like this gospel. Amen. I stand here today saying, he got up. Yeah. He got up. The resurrection is the genesis of the revelation of our hope. That's what it is. Hear me today. We've all sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. But I truly believe that Jesus is who he said he was. I believe he was the sinless son of God. I believe he died on a cross to take my place. And he arose that third day victorious over death and hell and the grave. Greg Groeschel wrote a book three years ago called The Christian Atheist. Well, that's a name, isn't it? That's the name of a book, The Christian Atheist. It's about someone who believes in God but lives like God doesn't exist. Craig asked this question. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? The resurrection is not something that we celebrate once a year. It's something we celebrate every day. The spirit that raised him up dwells in us, and it shall also quicken our mortal bodies. So 2,000 years ago, if you were a gambling man or woman, you were placing bets on the Roman Empire, or on this thing called Christianity, it was a no-brainer. Rome ruled the world. 
Jesus had a handful of followers, and they weren't exactly what we call first-round draft picks. There really wasn't. But here we are 2,000 years later, and you may eat an occasional Caesar salad, but you can't name seven Caesars. But the Roman Empire is long gone. However, two billion people around this world profess Jesus Christ as their Savior. Yeah. Come on now. Are you one of them? Are you one of them? Do you call him Jesus? Do you call him Savior? But most important, do you call him Lord? So how does this happen? The best I got for you, it is an empty tomb. So do you believe it and are you living like it? Here's my word to you today. Please stay with me. Those people that are leaving, a lot of them are volunteers. They're going to take care of you. I'm not through with y'all yet. <laughs> Here's my word for you today. Run to the tomb. And if it's empty, start living like it. Come on. Start living like it. Start living like it. Do you know that one day can change the whole course of your life? Do you know that one day can change everything that you ever believed about Jesus Christ? You walk into his presence. One of the reasons that this church has such an attraction is because we believe the presence of God is real. And we believe that it's something you can feel. It's not just emotion, it is his presence. And we don't do the presence of God stupid here. We don't do it stupid, but we let the presence of God move in this house. And God convicts hearts and God touches lives. And while you're sitting there, God can heal your heart. And while you're walking out, God can correct your steps. And when you get on your knees, when you get home, God can say, you can go back and get more of that. I want to be your savior for the rest of your life. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. You know, one reason Peter ran to the tomb because he made so many mistakes there at the end. He cut a man's ear off and then he denied the Lord three times at the fireplace when Jesus was being tried. And Peter had a horrible heart failure. He said, I've messed up. And he ran, he ran to see if the tomb was empty. And not only did he see the grave clothes, but he saw a napkin folded in a place by itself signifying that whoever put that napkin there was not going to leave him forever. He was going to come back. He was going to come back. He's going to come back and be with them. That's what it represented. And so what I'm telling you today, no matter how tough life has been on you pre-Easter, how bad it's been going through COVID, how bad it's been going through 21, here we are today on Easter 2022. And I think, I really think this, I think this whole audience ought to stand to their feet in one accord and give the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords the greatest praise and hand clap you've ever given him in your life because he is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. 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 Hey, man, don't leave me. We're going to pray right now. We're going to bless you. And then we're going to also pray a prayer that everybody can pray. And if you're not right, you can get right today. There's no sense preaching to you and then letting you just walk out of here without making a commitment. But let me bless you today. Dear Father, thank you for this congregation that's gathered here today on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday. Thank you for the love you have for us. And thank you for our response to your love. Lord, it's not the love that we give away that blesses us. It's the love we're able to receive that heals us. And Lord, thank you for letting us receive your love and receive your presence into our life today. I love you, Jesus, as the pastor of this congregation, along with Pastor Brad. Thank you for this. 
thank you for this day thank you for this resurrection season and thank you for real life real hope real joy in our souls and in our hearts now bless us all week bring us back next week at a at a beautiful time to to start our brand new series that we're starting next Sunday. And thank you because you allowed people to call this church their place of worship today. I honor them all. For it's in Christ's name I pray. And everybody said amen. Hey, everybody put your hands in the air. There's some here that have not ever chosen the Lord in their life. So all, all of us are going to pray this same prayer. So nobody will be embarrassed because we're not here to embarrass people. We're here to love people to Jesus. So I want you to put your hands up, and I want you to repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I love you, and I thank you for coming to the cross, being buried, and getting up on the third day. That gives me hope. That gives me faith to believe that you are real. Now, Jesus, I hadn't done everything right. My thoughts have not been good. My actions have not been good. My speech has not been good. But Lord, today, I open up my mouth and I confess you are Lord. To the glory of God the Father, I confess you are Lord. And I believe that God raised you up from the grave. Lord, would you save me today? Would you redeem me today? Would you touch my heart completely? And let me walk a different route than I've ever walked in my life. In Jesus' name, I receive you to myself. Amen. Now, if you've said that for the first time, we're going to rejoice with you. If you said it for the 50th time, we're going to rejoice with you. You might as well leave here today believing that God did something great in your life today. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Aren't you glad? Come on. Rejoice. Sing us out of here. I love you. See you next week. You're the blessed people.